And now for our scripture reading from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 2, verses 13 to 23. Now, after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah, a voice was heard in Ramah, wailing in loud lamentation. Rachel, weeping for her children, she refused to be consoled because they are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who are seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. This is the good news of the Lord. Be to God. Grace and peace to you this morning. Grace and peace. Matthew's story of the authoritarian dictator trying to kill the innocent baby to prevent him from growing up to be the liberator of our people. Yeah, that story would have been very familiar to all all of those people who identified with being the children of Abraham, the descendants of Moses. Matthew's gospel understands that struggle between good and evil, between the power, so to speak, of the empire and the power of God's love. Those, those people who inhabit the Holy Land, they have known war and the brutality of empire builders for so long that by the time of Jesus, it was already a relatively common practice for someone who wanted to escape the wrath of a local king to go to Egypt. They went by way of established trading routes. They didn't wander in the desert for 40 years. And it wasn't something that was just done every year for fun. It was still escaping for your life. But Mary and Joseph were not the first to discover this. I suspect that when Matthew wrote this story, he was quite aware that he was telling this story in order to make a point and really to point to a more deeply theological lesson that applies to our lives today. This is a truth. We know all about those stories that are meant to teach a lesson. Some may call them parables. Some may call them myths or archetypes. And the contemporary biblical scholars Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan refer to these birth narratives in both Matthew and Luke as parabolic overtures. They're parables that set a theme for the whole rest of the gospel. So, if this story is supposed to communicate with us today, what is it saying? What does this say to us about the real meaning of Christmas? 
Mary and Joseph escaping with a baby to Egypt? How does this have anything to do with our lives? Well, <clears throat> perhaps we can all agree that at least it is saying that Matthew in this story is saying that Jesus understands that pain and evil are realities. They are realities which can and do impact our lives and we should not be so reluctant to talk about them. Bad things do happen to good people, even to Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. It was not a sign that God had abandoned them, nor were they being punished for lacking faith or any other so-called sin. Quite the contrary. Mary and Joseph are being pictured as model parents, protecting their precious baby so that God's plan for our salvation will come true. We may feel that when bad things happen, and I must admit, 2016 seems like a year when bad things just kept happening, but that does not mean that God is causing our misery, nor that God has stopped caring about us, loving us, calling us to get to work. Joseph was warned in a dream. Warned in a dream that Herod was going to kill all the babies. Okay, I think that counts as bad news when you're a new dad. God was speaking to him by opening up a possibility that Joseph, on his own, had not been thinking about. That this new baby thing could be a lot worse than what I feared. And when confronted with the reality that he needed to leave and protect his wife and this miracle baby, Joseph responded, he recognized a new option, and he fulfilled God's plan. And really, when confronted with dangerous military powers, even people today are choosing to try to escape to another country. You know, the next time that you hear someone on the news or on social media or even in person talking about refugees, undocumented aliens, or whatever kind of vocabulary they use. I understand they say illegals, but don't get me going. Just imagine, that's Mary holding her baby as they arrived in Egypt. You know, thinking about this story, or this parable, in light of what's occurring today, He went to Egypt. Okay, they're the bad guys. But when we compare it to us today, uh, the evil Egyptian empire seems more humane than America and the European countries. Or to put it more reasonably, maybe, God was able to use the Egyptian option to protect Jesus. Just like God can use any of us in any country or any culture today to bring God's kingdom to life in our midst. The reality of sin and evil means that we need to be aware, to be informed, and to be ready to respond. Now, you may be going about your life, standing in line in a checkout, minding your own business, and a stranger starts a conversation. Hmm. It could just be an opportunity to share your faith about how you really see things these days. <coughs> or we could pretend that we don't have any power, intelligence, or any good news to share using the rationalization that maybe talking about what really matters is not always seen as polite conversation. Yeah, maybe that was acceptable in the past, but I don't think we really have that luxury of 
being able to hide our light under a bushel anymore. 2016 was, well, it may have been the tipping point. Now, when you hear some nice white Christian making comments that are really just racist garbage, we need to remember that we do have the power to speak up and confront sin wherever it's taking root. When we encounter sexism in any of its contemporary disguises, heterosexism, male privilege, homophobia, or even the more blatantly aggressive physical actions, it does make a difference if we speak up and we let people know that their words and their behavior are just out of line. When we hear people talking about water pollution, whether it's coming from a faucet in Flint, an oil spill in the Kalamazoo River, or the potential of a pipeline break anywhere across the country, we need to make our voices heard. It's not that there's one easy answer. It's that the only good answer comes from everyone together having a place at the table discussing the problem. So, what will the new year bring? Is 2017 going to be as much of a nightmare as some folks are predicting? Is this going to be the year when environmental devastation and global climate change become so accepted or will they be accepted as priorities that require a systemic financial response? Will this be the year when we finally wake up to the effects of waging a so-called war on drugs that was really just an excuse for mass incarceration that destroyed individuals, families, communities, and state budgets? You know, churches all across the country have been incubators for social change in the past. And it's often been UCC churches, especially when working in coalition with others. Others that have helped make a difference in how we, in the big picture, change public opinion, change cultural attitudes, or just plain help people grow up. We say we know God is still speaking. And like in the gospel narrative today, when God spoke to Joseph as an angel or a dream, God may be speaking to us, maybe as a still, small voice, or as an awareness that, wow, we do have the power to do something, even if we can't completely fix the whole problem in one quick step. It's certainly may not be easy. You know, especially when it feels like there's such strong forces at work pulling our society back into problems that we thought we had solved. Or at least we thought we were making good progress toward them. But that's just the nature of life. Life is hard. Mary and Joseph could not possibly have had an easy time hiking with a baby down to Egypt. Heck, I think I'd feel overwhelmed making that same trip and even using an airplane today. I know. I can feel overwhelmed by the magnitude of the problems that feel impossibly difficult, especially when I try to imagine what 2017 may bring. But if we look at the parable again, the angel did not tell Joseph to dismantle the entire Roman Empire, nor to go assassinate Herod. And I don't think we are being called to fix everything all by ourselves, all at once, any more than Joseph was in the story. No. What we are called to do is to have faith, to remember that we have faced difficulties in the past, and we're very likely to face them in the future. The thing I have learned personally in 2016 is that I am really spectacularly not good at predicting the future, even a few months in advance, the entire 2016. Whew, what a year. 
And yet, among the many things that I didn't see coming until they happened, were occasions of grace and joy when things worked out better than any would, anyone would have believed. It was just awesome. When we focus on looking for signs that light does conquer darkness, you know, opportunities to, for us to be God's hands and voice in a world so full of pain, we just may be surprised that there really are many good things happening and we're invited to be a part of it. Now, I know, to get to that kind of Pollyanna vision, things may be good. You might have to turn off the news once in a while to give yourself a temporary break from the fear mongers. I can't believe how much I can improve the intelligence of my television set by hitting either mute or power. It's a wonderful feeling. And you may have to start with some new spiritual, personal, faith-developing disciplines that help you discover serenity, peace, and good health. You know, you may need to rebuild your ability to feel hope. And even this seems to be part of that parable in Matthew. Joseph is also told in a dream that the ones who wanted to come and kill baby Jesus are gone. It's safe to return home. You know? Hate to have to have the humility to say it, but sometimes we are not the ones who are actually responsible for conquering evil. We're not the ones that uh, manage to save the day every time. Sometimes we mess stuff up. And it's okay. Evil may be conquered without our direct involvement at all. And we need to be refreshed when that happens by hearing about it and realizing that goodness is at work here and all over in the community and around the world. We need to be connected with others where we can be spiritually refreshed which is what happens here on Sunday mornings and also all through the week. Sometimes your role that God's calling you to do is to be the messenger. And sharing the results of your efforts to create justice, peace, respect, and joy are things that other people need to hear. Sometimes you're the one getting your battery charged up by hearing God speaking. Now, I told Pastor Peter that I was going to preach on Capoeira Manjinga. That's my martial art on Tuesday and Thursday night. And uh, I'd hate to disappoint him, so I must say it is true. I do see a lot of parables, parallels between coming to class to practice a Brazilian martial art and coming to church. There are many days when I might not feel like showing up to class, a two-hour workout after a full day of work, yuck, I think I could just do a little stretching on my own, or, you know, maybe even try a Pilates video on YouTube, but no, that never really happens. I've found that <clears throat> if I just ignore those feelings, I come to class, the time goes by amazingly fast, and I always leave feeling so much better than when I arrived. And church attendance has its parallels. We learn new perspectives. We see friends. We meet new people. So as we begin a new year, are you feeling that, hey, we can kick back, become more complacent, and know that if there are any problems in the world, God will magically fix it all for us? No, I don't imagine there's too many folks around here who truly believe that. But I do suspect that people who worship at Pilgrim UCC are very well of the fact that evil and pain exist. And they are people, people who worship here that God has entrusted us with the care and stewardship of all creation within our congregation, our community, and the world. 
We are the ones who can recognize injustice, sin, and evil. And we know that we are called to live our faith by sharing the light of God's love. We come here to be spiritually refreshed, to share in music, scripture, prayer, and praise. We come to be in fellowship with kindred spirits and to stretch our assumptions about who are my neighbors. And we come to recognize the spirit of the living Christ in our midst. Thanks be to God. Amen.